us be. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your love for us prompted this salvific act of your Son coming to offer himself as a sacrifice for us. He took our penalty and he took our pain and he took our sin and he took our shame and he rose from the dead in victory over death. And, and if nothing else today, we want to proclaim that he is worthy to receive all honor and glory and praise. And may it come out of our hearts and minds first and then may it come out of our lives by the way that we live. May you bless this message. May we learn from it and may you inspire us through your spirit for we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and please be seated. This week, a woman in Tampa accidentally tossed her engagement ring into the garbage. And she didn't realize it until the garbage was taken away by the sanitary uh, workers. So she frantically called her husband, and he came home to make sure that it was in the trash. He raced over to the recycling center, and with the help of the sanitary workers, he rifled through 10,000 pounds of garbage and he found the engagement ring. Now imagine the, the zeal, imagine the energy, imagine the excitement when he called his wife and said, I found it. Well, that same energy, that level of, of exerted effort is the same that David was referring to when he said, in talking about his longing for God, as the hunted deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, God. It's what Peter meant when he said we are to diligently add spiritual virtues. It's what Paul meant when he said we are to pursue godliness. And it's the same intensity and exerted effort that Jesus meant when he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. A desire to have what God has for us. It's a popular practice in modern Christianity to pronounce God's favor, and then to pronounce it upon yourself and on things with the intent of receiving and enjoying health, wealth, and prosperity. But the early church, its focus was not receiving the fruit of health, wealth, and prosperity because those things were outside of possibility. Their passion was to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. And I would say for each one of us, if you and I had that energy and that zeal that that man from Tampa had this week who went to go find that engagement ring, if you and I had that in the same level of passion to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, we each would be walking gardens of Eden of virtue. But it begins with us at this phase. God has put it within us, and it's up, for, up to us to let it come out. So, so far we've discussed faith, hope, life, peace, joy, and patience. Today we're going to look at kindness. It's the trait of the Holy Spirit listed fifth in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Next week we'll talk about the sixth one, and it's goodness. And I want to throw you out a question and try to answer it this week. Why does goodness come after kindness in this list? And we'll give you that answer next week. But it's kindness. When a loving, joyful, and peace-filled heart reaches out to others, it does so with patience and kindness. The last two aspects of the fruit that we have been talking about. Last week was patience. Today it's kindness. As I was growing up, I don't remember my mom and my dad telling me to be kind or kindness was a great virtue to have. My dad was a military man. My mother had been in the military. Things were orderly and things were neat. They never actually said that, but they both lived it out. Um, I was blessed to have a very kind father who I didn't, I can't even remember actually him raising his voice. I remember him getting angry and, you know, wanting to rip my hair out, but he never actually raised his voice. He was very kind towards animals, kind towards other kids, and I got to see that modeled my entire life having kind parents, but it wasn't something that was presented as this is a virtue you should develop and cultivate. It was exampled. I think we live in a culture today where we need to train our children to be kind. It's one of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit that God wants us to have. The word kindness in Greek is the word krestotis, 
And it, it's translated gentleness in some versions, but the, the best translation is kindness. But it can also mean gentleness, goodness, and even sweetness. Synonyms would be friendly, generous, considerate, affectionate, tender-hearted, and warm-hearted. That has been put in every believer by the Holy Spirit. It's waiting to come forth. God wants it to come forth. Every man should be kind. Every woman should be kind. It should be just as important as you being strong, as you being decisive, as you being motivated, as you being ambitious, as you having character and integrity. We are to have kindness. The word Christodes, a form of it is the word Christos. It's the word that Christ uses to describe his yoke. When he says, my yoke is easy, it's the word Christos. When Greeks describe really good wine, they say it's Christos which means it's rich and mellow. Christos, or kindness, it is a grace that permeates your entire being, mellowing out everything that would be harsh and austere. A lot of factors come into our lives as you're growing up, and they can put little resentments and anger and cynicism and skepticism into your life. Something has to counterbalance that, or we will walk around angry, agitated, frustrated constantly. Well, when you get born again, inside you is put in the fruit of the Spirit this one aspect, which is now the fifth one, kindness, so that you can interact with others in that way. Christodes, or kindness, is your disposition. It's the Spirit that prompts good deeds. Anybody can do good deeds, but the only good deeds that matter are those that are prompted by Christodes a kind spirit. In James chapter 3, James warns the people, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, the word Christodes, willing to yield, full of mercy. So often we think knowledge and truth and wisdom is forceful and it's dogmatic and it's imposing. But James said, no, the wisdom that comes from God is first pure, it's singular, it's undiluted, unpolluted, and then it's peaceable and gentle or kind. Kindness draws people to you, whether it's in friendship or in romance. One of the most powerful elements that creates a lasting bond between people is kindness. Everyone likes it. Everyone enjoys it. I've never heard anybody complain, oh, that person's just so kind, it makes me sick. <laughs> Nobody dislikes it. We all treasure it, even if we don't display it ourselves. We all appreciate somebody who is kind. Muhammad Ali said, service to others, or kindness, is the rent you pay for the, the room you have here on earth. Kindness. Every religion, every philosophy, everybody appreciates kindness kindness. They may be very selective as to who they show it to, but it's still treasured. For the believer, it's to come out as fruit. To be hanging from the branches of your life so anybody can take part. Kindness. There's an amazing truth that I mentioned on Wednesday night that I never really saw until a couple of weeks ago when I was preparing this message. The role that kindness played in you and I having the gospel. It was Joseph and Mary. Joseph, the Bible says, was a just man, a righteous man. And because he did not want to put Mary away publicly, he sought a way to divorce her privately because he had not yet been told by the angel that she's pregnant of the Holy Spirit. This is Palestine. This is the Middle East in which a man's integrity and his honor and his spiritual vibrancy came from him holding true to the law. And even if your wife violated it, you would stone her or whatever the penalty was in that particular village. That was imposed without question. And you were elevated because of it. You became more honorable. You became more virtuous because you would be willing to divorce and even put your wife into the courts for stoning. Because Joseph was a just man and a kind man. He didn't want his wife to be punished for being pregnant outside of marriage, so he sought a way to do it quietly, to take care of her. 
That's when the angel came and said, don't be afraid to marry her because what is inside her is of the Holy Spirit. What if Joseph hadn't been kind? What if Joseph thought she cheated on me and she deserves what she gets and I'll be a hero in the community for standing up for virtue and I'm going to expose my wife to the tormentors? He would have been a hero. But what would have happened to the gospel? We all know that God chose Mary, but he chose Joseph because Joseph was kind. We should be kind because God has been kind to us. In Titus chapter 3, Titus is exhorting them to speak evil of no one. Paul's exhorting Titus to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were once also foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness, the Christodes, and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, according to his mercy, he saved us. If you're a believer today, it's not because you're so great, it's because God was kind. And because of his kindness, he provided you salvation. So we should treat others the same way. Kindness should be at the heart of our ministry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. The kindness of ministry, to love the people you're serving, to love the people in your life who you need to minister to, to do so out of kindness. It's not a weakness. It's not a flaw in your character. It is the fruit of the Spirit coming forth in you if you allow it. And here's one way it often shows up or doesn't show up. Kindness should govern our speech. Proverbs 31, woman, she opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Paul says in Ephesians 4, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. To the Colossians, he said, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And then Proverbs tells us, a soft answer turns away wrath. Years ago, when I was in Bible college, I had a, a pastor, professor, mentor, make a presentation to us as preacher boys, they called us back then, about learning how to control your tongue. And just because you think something doesn't mean you should say it. And just because something's right doesn't mean it's the right time to say it. And just because you can lace somebody out, you need to do it with kindness because it's the impact that's more important than the communication. And it got me to thinking because I was, uh, uh, um, how, how, how could I say it? Uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know what the word would be, but if I thought something, I said it. And I said it really fast, too. So sometimes people didn't hear what I said. I'd say it so fast. But I was embarrassed once as a little grade school boy, sixth, seventh grade, somewhere in there. We're at a big family event, and my brother was just harassing me. And sort of like the ball players I saw yesterday in a game where the defender was harping on a guy, and the, the receiver just lost his temper, grabbed the guy, threw him on the ground, and started punching him. That, that's what my brother was doing to me for about an hour at this family event. And I turned to him, and I called him a cuss word. Well, the whole family heard it. <gasps> and I, How did I even know that word? Well, it was a horrifying event, and I got in big trouble for it. And um, my mom used to spank with a pussy willow branch. They were right outside the house, these long little pussy willow branches. She'd take that down and slowly take off the little cushion things. And I got switched with that for cussing in front of the entire... That's probably the last time I've actually cussed. That was so painful. But I, I have the capacity to blurt out. So I have to focus on pausing before I speak. Because sometimes humor comes out, sometimes it's sarcasm, and I have to stop and think, hey, what? And wait till the emotion goes this way and then speak. But I have to force myself to do it. There's some people who just do that naturally. 
just no harsh words are ever going to come out of their mouth. They're just kind. Uh, not me. I have to really work on that. Kindness is supposed to govern the way we talk. And if it doesn't govern that, it's not going to govern anything else. Kindness will lead us away from arguing with opposition. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. As a servant of the Lord, you must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. When somebody opposes you or conflicts with you, it doesn't do any good to argue, but rather respond with kindness and gentleness and humility. Kindness is essential to maintaining your patience. Second Corinthians chapter 6, We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. In all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, and by kindness, Christoti. The kindness is what feeds the patience, and the patience feeds the kindness. I told you about my father being a kind man, and I remember as a boy when he would coach my Little League baseball team. They would get all the boys who were going to be playing Little League baseball, all the coaches would be there, and the coaches got to say, I want that one, I want that one, I want that one. As your name was called, you came and stood next to the coach. My dad always chose me first, so he chose me. They went down the line. It's my dad's turn again. And there's a young friend of mine who had a cleft palate and a a hair lip uh, stitching, small little fella, big thick glasses, and he was a friend of mine, and my dad was a friend with his dad, and my dad called him. Well, everybody's, oh, what? Why? Why would you choose him number two? And he chose him, and Brandon came and stood next to me, and he was all proud and excited. We were going to be on the same team together, and probably for two years we didn't win a game. And after every game, Dad would take us all to go get ice cream after the game. And by the third year, everybody wanted to be on my dad's team. We weren't winning anything, but we were having ice creams and shakes after every game, having a great time, having fun. By the third and fourth year, fifth and sixth grade, we were champions. We would win most of the games. And this little kid who was frail with big, thick glasses and the hair lip and the cleft palate, he became a fantastic baseball player and an outfielder because my dad wanted him to feel good, and he chose him to be on the team. I got the opportunity to see that model many, many times when animals were caught on our property, whether it was a squirrel or a rabbit and little babies left laying in the grass. Dad would pick it up and nurture it and bring it into the house and take care of it. And I had the chance to watch what kindness is. It's not selective. It goes to everybody. It just comes out. And I hope that in your life you've had somebody model that for you. But even if you haven't, the Holy Spirit put it in you and it should come out. Kindness is something we can all have regardless of our personality type. Well, Pastor Dave, I'm just, I'm more of a forceful, open mouth kind of bull in a china closet kind of guy or kind of girl. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you are. We can all be patient. It's the fruit of the Spirit's personality, not yours. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. It's also a reflection of the son's personality. He said, I am gentle and lowly in heart. I am the good shepherd. I come to serve, not to be served. And it's the testimony of the father's personality. In Psalm 86, the psalmist writes, You, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in mercy and truth. For your mercy reaches into the heavens and your truth into the clouds. Kindness is not beyond any of us, regardless of your personality or your temperament or your spiritual gifting. And it doesn't require any money, but it might require the sacrifice of time and energy. It might require you listening to somebody. It might require the discipline of considering other people's thoughts and needs to be equal with your own. It doesn't require much to act. How much does it cost to smile, to listen? to give somebody a hug, to say a word of encouragement, kindness. Every one of us can do that. 
Kindness must be shown, the Bible says, to other believers. Galatians 6, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We are to love one another. Christ said, that's the way the whole world's going to know. You're my disciples. And then he says, we are to have a fervent love for one another. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So if somebody's a believer in Christ, we should be kind towards them. In the Old Testament, the equivalent word is hesed. And hesed means loving kindness, mercy, love, and compassion. It's what Micah is referring to when he says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So not only to other believers, but kindness must also be shown to those who oppose us. And I want to read to you a passage before we close the service. It describes an event between David and the house of Saul, his arch enemy. Not by David's doing, but by Saul's doing. Saul had come to be jealously hateful of David. Saul tried to kill David numerous times. David had the opportunity to kill Saul in defense, and he did not do it. When Saul is finally dead and his son Jonathan died with him, David now becomes king. And in those days when you became king, you wiped out the other king's family. Because another, another relative of another king is just a revolution waiting to happen. So you had to cement your right and your claim to the throne by destroying their family. David does something different. In chapter 9, the Bible says, David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? This would have caused everybody just to freeze. The question wouldn't make any sense. Does he really mean it? Or is he just trying to investigate who the next threat is so he can wipe him out? Jonathan was David's best friend. Jonathan was the son of Saul who had tried to kill David many times. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? Now Ziba doesn't know what's in David's mind. Ziba has been charged by his allegiance to Saul to watch after any surviving relative. But David said, I want to show him the kindness of God. So David saw his responsibility to react to an enemy's family member as I have an obligation to show God's kindness to this person. So he surrenders his own personal sense of justice or defending his own claim to the throne to the priority of the kindness of God being displayed. And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So in those days, that means you're pretty useless. The guy couldn't do anything. So he's a useless, non-contributing member of the enemy king's family. So the king said to him, well, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, well, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face, prostrated himself. And then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, here is your servant. And his head is probably still bowed, not knowing if it's going to get lopped off. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat at my table continually. David's kindness was extravagant and it was personal and it was embracive and it was um, detailed and specific. Then he bowed and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to his house, meaning it's up to you to look after this man. 
You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your lame master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. And a very patriarchal, honor-driven, um, royal protocol following environment David breaks all that and says, I'm going to show you the kindness of God. And he shows it to somebody who can do nothing for him. Kindness has an even greater impact when the recipient uh, doesn't deserve it. And when it's displayed, kindness elevates that undeserving recipient to worthiness. In the house of David, Mephibosheth, the lame son of the opposing king was a man of honor and respect because he ate at the king's table every day. So we should be kind to everyone, even those who oppose us. We should be kind to others as an expression of God's kindness. We should be kind to those who offer us nothing in return. Our kindness should include personal involvement and interaction, not just donations, and our kindness should be extravagant and unconditional. So in each one of us here today, God has put in us the fruit of the Spirit, and part of that fruit is kindness. Are you kind? It's a great treasure to pursue is kindness. Not highly valued, but always appreciated. If you are kind, you will never be lonely. If you are kind, you'll never be without purpose because your kindness will always be looking for something to demonstrate kindness to. Let me encourage you today to ask God to, to realign your value system and to put kindness back in the place it should be where your husband, your wife, your children, your co-workers, your church family, your neighbors, see the kindness of God in you. Because when they see the kindness of God, they see God. The fruit of the Spirit is in you, waiting to bud, waiting to produce. Are you going to allow it? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that, first of all, you are kind, and you demonstrated kindness, and then you implanted kindness within us. And we confess to you that we have failed many, many times in cultivating that kindness, prioritizing that kindness, allowing it to grow. Instead, we are self-assertive and self-interested and vindictive. And we put ourselves first and we make sure all those who don't suffer the consequences. Father, may we receive the challenge of the Holy Spirit today to allow the manifestation of His personality to come forth. That we will allow the personality of Jesus Christ, our Savior, to come forth. That our lives might demonstrate the personality of the Heavenly Father. May you awaken each one of us to this opportunity. And Father, for all the things we strive to be here at Faith, we want to preach and teach the truth. We want to do it accurately. We want to do it effectively. But Father, help us to always do it with kindness, even to those who might oppose us. And let me give you a moment to consider the words of this message as to how it may or may not have applied to you. And if God has said something to you about how he wants you to respond to this call to be kind, As you pray, and in the days ahead, ask the Lord to reveal to you what is the garbage that's surrounding your heart that's preventing kindness from coming forth. And like that man from Tampa, go in there and get rid of that garbage.
that this fruit may prosper. If you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I pray that you will do so today. Respond to the amazing truth that he came to live a sinless life and die as a sinner on the cross, taking our sin upon him so that we would not have to, that he rose from the dead and victory over death, and he will give you salvation if you respond by faith. Know the kindness of God, and you'll know what it means to be kind. Father, may you bless each one of us here with a, a greater devotion and awareness of this wonderful opportunity to reflect you to others.